Welcome. I'm Kathy Cody Hudson, Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Vermont. And we're so pleased to have you join us for today's Ollie Distinguished Speaker Series presentation, How Vermont is Addressing Its Affordable Housing Needs with Mara Collins. A special thank you to AARP for sponsoring seats again in our series. Welcome to our AARP members and welcome to our new and returning Ollie members from across Vermont, the country and Canada. We really are appreciative of your continued participation and support of Ollie. Before we begin, a couple of virtual housekeeping reminders. We do encourage you to enter your questions in the chat box. We'll do our best to get to each one at the end. And please refer to the instructions in the chat box if you want to activate live captioning on your screen. We're recording this presentation and we will send it out to participants in the next day or two. So today we welcome our distinguished speaker. Mara Collins is the executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, a statewide affordable housing funder. She has worked at BHFA since 2002 she received her master's in public administration from the University of Vermont, and she has served on UVM's faculty, teaching graduate level housing policy courses. In her spare time, Mara is on the board of Pathways Vermont. So please join me in welcoming Mara Collins. Thank you, Kathy. Should I just jump right in? Yes, you may. This is excellent. I'm so happy to be here today. I will tell you right off the bat, I'm not a Vermonter. I've only been here 20 years, uh, but I say that at the outset because we might go fast through some things, uh, but I'm very happy to slow down, answer questions. In fact, I'd love to get people thinking about questions that they have about housing in Vermont right off the bat, because I think y'all came with questions. I think you signed up today because you were wondering about why are prices going up so fast and furious? Uh, what do interest rates, if they are going to be going up this year, what's that going to do to our housing market? Do we have a bubble going on maybe? Because, you know, 10, 15 years ago in the last recession, there was a housing crisis specifically. Is that going to happen again? I'm sure you have questions. And if we were in person, I'd be the kind of person who would say, let's start with questions. I'd ask you to tell me your questions, and then I'd try to weave those into my presentation throughout. So being virtual, I can't quite promise as seamless of a transition, but if you wanna put in the chat what your questions are, what you're hoping to get out of the next hour, what you want me to focus on, I am a Swiss army knife, only when it comes to housing. I can't answer any questions that don't have to do with housing but I'd love to take a stab, whether it be around the state's response to homelessness through the pandemic, whether it be about starter homes in the state, uh, what's going on with rental vacancies right now, or anything in between. So I welcome your chat um, questions. And I also will say I'm so excited to be here today because I was due to give this same talk March 15th of 2020, maybe it was March 18th. I can't promise the number, but I know it was like right there, right when this was my first thing that got canceled, in-person event that got canceled as a result of COVID. So I'm happy to be here today because while I never would have imagined that that postponement back in March of 2020 would have lasted this long, uh, I am happy to have the opportunity to talk today about my favorite topic and also to, um, I don't know, dig into this. So I'm going to, I don't see any questions yet. So I'm going to start through a very I, short I can, slide deck. I can, um, ask, I can um, pose a question. There are a couple coming directly to me. So oh, um, do you want me to read them? Sure. Oops. Okay. So why are taxes so high here? I live in Brattleboro and am a senior. Yep. All right. I'm not going to answer them all right now. I'm going to make a note and I'm going to so, weave them in later on. Okay. I well, then I'll send them that, directly to you. Great. I see one to me that talks about what is affordable housing. That's a good question. That's one I get asked every time. Um, and so the question is about do we have to subsidize it forever or is it affordable right off the bat? 
Um, and yes, I see a question about housing happening in Morrisville. And I know exactly what projects you're talking about. There's some exciting things happening in Moyle County I can talk about. So while the questions keep coming in, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we know is happening right now, which this is not a COVID stat. This is, I would have told you the same statistic for the past 10 plus years, which is that a third of us in the state pay too much for housing. So the question that came to me about what is affordable housing, it's that first bullet on the slide. Every house in this state is absolutely affordable. You can write that down. The affordable housing expert says every house in Vermont is affordable if you earn enough money. So there are people out there, I'm going to guess Jeff Bezos or um, Elon Musk or whoever can afford just about every house in this state. The problem is, is that the rest of us can't. And so that's why housing is unaffordable is because it's a relationship between each of our incomes and housing prices. And so in an academic sense, in a perfect world, households would pay no more than 30% of their income for their housing costs. That includes taxes, that includes utilities, uh, and it includes your mortgage, which um, is your principal and interest and your homeowner's insurance. If you're a renter, it includes your full rent, which does pay for taxes. So the misnomer that renters don't pay taxes is not true because a landlord calculates what the building costs and then charges the rent needed. So that renter is paying the rent, which covers taxes, and it would cover their utilities. So 30% is the magic number. So if Vermonters don't earn much money, then there's not much affordable housing for them. If a Vermonter earns a lot of money, there's more housing available to them and they may not feel the affordable housing crunch quite as much. It's also important to know that this is an academic standard that makes my life easier by having a nice round number like 30%. It doesn't mean it's right for each of us individually. I'll tell you, I have three young children. I have childcare costs. That means maybe I shouldn't be pushing the envelope and spending 30% on housing because I have a big old expense that a lot of other Vermonters don't have. I may have high healthcare costs. I may have high transportation costs. I may have very high utility costs because um, of an unweatherized home or inefficient home. So all of these things come into play and we all um, have a different ratio exactly that we play or that we pay. But as you can see from the chart, you can see that 19% of all of the households are paying between 30 and 49% of their income for housing and another 15% are paying more than half their income for housing. I, I wish I had stacked these bars on top of each other so that you could see that you have to add those numbers together and see that 19% plus 15%, so 34% of Vermonters, are paying more than 30% of their income for housing. But the reason those red bars are on there to show how many are paying more than half their income is because those are the households that are at far greater risk of losing their home if they have, we say, one muffler away from potentially being without a home. If you're paying more than half your income, then whether it be a muffler that breaks or um, an unexpected medical bill, or the like, you may actually lose your home as a result because there's so little left. So the next slide talks about home sales and what's been happening there. Um, prices were rising even before the pandemic. So this is not new, but we do know that since the pandemic, the median home sale price has gone up 19%. And so there's a lot of factors that influence this. I'll say that for those of us in Chittenden County, uh, the median is far higher. Instead of 270,000, which is the statewide median, in Chittenden County, it was $385,000 last year. And just as a reminder, the median is the halfway point. So if we rate, um, ranked all the homes from 
uh, lowest price up to highest price, the median is the middle point. So it doesn't get swayed like an average does with an outlier of a, of a big million dollar home. Also, lots of Vermont counties have experienced home price increases as a result of the pandemic. And so we have seen surprisingly high home price increases in the Northeast Kingdom and in Lamoille County and not just Chittenden County. In fact, Chittenden County's increase has been a bit more modest compared to other uh, counties. And some of that is likely because of um, the high number of vacation homes there are in other counties and that some of those vacation homes are now being sold as primary residences or more primary residences, meaning someone's primary home is now being sold as a vacation home. These numbers tell us though, I'm sorry, I have some notes on my other monitor over here. So if you see me looking, it's because I'm reading. Because uh, when, when I start quoting numbers, you're gonna see me looking sideways. Um, that the, you would need to earn an income of just over $73,000 to afford that median priced home. Whereas the actual median income in our state last year was $62,000. So we'd like to see the median income Vermonter be able to afford the median income home. And that's not the case right now. You'd have to earn 73 grand uh, to buy that home, but actual median incomes are closer to 62 grand. And here's even worse. That's, I'm giving you the median of all Vermonters, but if you look at the median income of Vermont renters, meaning those are the people who want to be first time home buyers, want to put down roots, want to settle in this state, want to call this home and make our communities more vibrant by having them be a part of, be a part of our state, their median income is $36,000. So now you see why, by the numbers, it's harder and harder for folks to um, make that entry into homeownership. So how does Vermont compare? Well, nationally, home prices have gone up by 18.5% from this past December of 2021 from a year prior to that. There was no state that saw a decline in home prices. The states with the highest increases were Arizona, followed by Florida, followed by Utah. So all over the country, we're seeing big increases. There are lots of fluctuations month to month with this. I can tell you that uh, Vermont was a dark purple shade just two months ago. We were one of the top 10 states with a 20% home price appreciation. But each month, more home sales come in and these numbers fluctuate. But you can see that home prices are going up everywhere. And you can see that um, they're projected to continue to go up, but not at the same rate as we come out of the pandemic. So what this map is showing us is that if you just look at November to December, because this data um, is all from December, there's a little lag to it. But if you looked at the difference between November to December, home prices nationally went up 1.3%. But if you looked at December to the year prior, they went up 18.5%, which I mentioned. This organization, CoreLogic, uh, forecasts what we can expect. And they're saying that between December and January, we wouldn't see any appreciation. There's actually not a lot of homes that sell in December and January. It's the holidays and uh, it's a hard time to pull your kids out of school. And so there's often not a lot of transactions happening in the dead of winter. Um, but if you look at uh, December, 2021 and compare it to where this organization thinks will be in December of 2022, they are expecting another three and a half percent increase. So one reason for this drop off of that home prices probably won't go up quite as fast and furious as before is rising interest rates. And most economists agree that prices won't escalate as fast because interest rates will mean that there's less affordability. And consumer desire for homeownership 
is going to stay strong though. And we have consistently not built enough homes in this country. And so that is going to continue to put pressure on prices because we know that even though interest rates will make homes less affordable, we just need more homes. The nation has underbuilt um, by millions and millions of homes. And so it's not just a Vermont problem that we haven't been building enough. It's happening nationally. Uh, there are questions about, are we in a housing bubble? And uh, this CoreLogic organization that I respect based on their data, they do suggest a small probability of nationwide price decline, but it's much more likely that we will see price declines in certain metro markets. Um, meaning that those are the at-risk markets that have a history of potentially overbuilding historically. So um, largely though, they're not calling, I don't see any economists in my world calling for large scale price declines. Most are calling for what you see here, which is a slowing of the appreciation to something a bit more normal and natural that we've been used to. Now, our housing market is not just about homeownership. Renters are an important piece of our housing market. 95% of Americans were renters at some point in their life. So we can't ever forget about the importance of rentals because they're an important rung on the ladder that moves someone up to um, achieve homeownership. And the fair market rent in the Burlington area is over 1200 almost $1,300 right now. A fair market rent is a HUD standard that has to do with their affordable housing programs. And it takes that median, that middle point that I talked about, and it says, what's the rent at just below that, at the 40th percentile? So not the 50th percentile, which is the median, but just below that. That is what um, the $1,265 a month rent is. So that's really a modest one bedroom apartment. The rent affordable at the average renter's wage though is only $800. And so there is rental assistance available. In fact, the um, there were COVID related protections that had um, eviction moratoriums for a long time. And the federal government has put more rental assistance out and made it available than really at any time uh, anyone can imagine or remember. But historically, it's always been that only 25% of the people who qualify for rental assistance actually get it. This is not an entitlement program where uh, just because you're lower income, you get a Section 8 voucher, housing choice voucher. Instead, it's very different and um, a lot of folks don't get that golden ticket. So uh, it is really hard for people to become first time home buyers when rent prices are increasing as much as they have been. Uh, we know that since the pandemic, prices continue to go up. So these stats that I'm giving you today are probably even higher now. But before I move on, I want to um, explain what this bar chart is, because you all are probably nowhere near as nerdy as I am, and you don't use phrases like housing wage. But a uh, housing wage is uh, something we in housing refer to, which is the wage needed to afford that one bedroom apartment at that HUD standard, that modest one bedroom apartment, and only pay 30% of their income for their rent. So that's where I say it's an academic rule of thumb that we use. So we know that if your rent was $1,265, then you would need to earn $24.33 an hour in order to afford that apartment. Yet, as I put here, the hourly rate wage actually earned by average renters is closer to 15 bucks. So you can see why we have a problem. And a lot of people talk about, well, then get a roommate, which is totally fair. Uh, I, most of us have had roommates at some point. Um, and so that is a viable option for people to make their housing more affordable. In addition, it's important to know that more than half of Vermont's renters only have one 
full-time wage earner or less. So we don't see a lot of, um, the majority of renters actually only have one wage earner. And we can appreciate that there are a lot of housing situ uh, family situations, household situations, where having roommates becomes more difficult, for instance, once you're married and have children and the like. And so we need to make sure that we have affordable housing for people at all life stages. So the question inevitably comes, why are housing prices so high? And I already spoke to how we haven't been keeping up with the building that we need to do. Now, the glory days of Vermont's growth, and some wouldn't call it glory days, but I'll say that Vermont grew the most in both population and households during in the post-World War II era. So from the 50s through the 70s to 80s, that's when we had the interstate and a lot of people were moving into Vermont. In addition, we had the impact of the baby boom and um, the, we just saw unprecedented growth in our state. And so in the 80s, that was when we started to see our growth uh, bend down. This is the second half of the bell curve. This is when we start to come down in terms of our growth. But in the 80s, we were still growing our year-round housing stock. And I say year-round because I'm focused on primary residences. I've mentioned before that we have a lot of vacation homes in our state. In fact, Vermont and Maine are the two states with the most vacation homes as a proportion of all their housing stock. It's like 19% of our housing stock right now are vacation homes. So they're off the market to Vermonters to live in year round. So I really, most of my data always focuses on primary residences, year round housing. And in the eighties, we were adding uh, almost 2% of our housing stock every year. So that meant roughly 3,400 homes a year were being brought onto the market, being built and, and um, to house Vermonters. And you can see that every decade since that has dropped off. And recently, uh, the most recent decade that just ended, we know that about 1400 homes were being created each year. And so it hasn't kept up with um, the demands of Vermonters. Now that confuses people though, in fairness, because our population really hasn't been growing that much. We've heard that for years. I mean, pre-pandemic, we knew that Vermont wasn't growing a whole lot. So why do we need all these new homes if our population is stagnant or really only growing in Chittenden County or something like that? Why do we need so many homes? Well, because population is different than households. So population is how many people we have, and that has been relatively flat for a while. But the number of households we have is growing. And what you have to remember is, is how often one household becomes two. One household becomes two when a child reaches a certain age and moves out on their own. In some cases, one household can become four if you have three children. One household becomes two when there's a divorce. Um, and so there's a lot of times when we can grow the number of households we have, but not necessarily be growing our population dramatically. So if we have more households, it means we need more housing. And we know that the average household size is going down just about every year. We're over, it's trending down, definitely. We live in smaller households and we're not as likely to bring in multi-generational uh, members of the family. And we also uh, get married later and do make a lot of choices that means that uh, we have very small households. We live alone for much longer, much more comfortably um, at this point. So um, as the lack, when there's a lack of supply, that increase says that just drives up rent and drives up sale prices. Additionally, over this time period, the 80s had high interest rates, but from the 90s through the early 2000s and the 2010 decade, we've seen historically very low interest rates. 
So also I want to point out that housing used to be uh, done a bit differently. It used to be that municipalities would welcome developers to build housing in their community. They used to be seen, heroes is too strong a word, I'll own it, but they used to be seen as partners in growing a community. Developers were, were lured in because municipalities would put in roads with sidewalks and curbs and lighting and maybe even a rec path and ask a developer, that would incent a developer to come in and plop a bunch of homes in a subdivision and poof, we have a neighborhood. That doesn't happen anymore. The reality of municipalities is that they are cash strapped. They don't have the money to put in roads and curbs and sidewalks if someone's not paying the bill. So instead, those costs have been shifted back to the developer. And the uh, overly simplistic attitude, because this isn't doing any community quite the justice they deserve, but the simplistic attitude has been, you're gonna make money off these homes. If you wanna build in my town, I want you to have some skin in the game. I want you to put in a sidewalk. I want you to put in some lights and we're gonna have certain design features that our community requires so that we keep up the character of our community. And so we want you to put in a rec path and we want you to pay some impact fees for the impact of the kids in the school district that'll inevitably happen. And we put that burden, that financial burden on developers. They in turn tack that onto the sales price of a home. And then we wonder why housing is so expensive. There is no, um, I'm not trying to bash municipalities because their cash constraints are very real and they don't have money to um, put in the infrastructure that they used to. And at the same time, developers don't have a magic pot of money that can pay for these things for them. And this is why the burden gets put on um, the home prices. So why don't we build more homes? Well, there's fewer government subsidies in the past. The HUD budget is far smaller than it has been in a long time. I spoke about how only 25% of eligible renters can get rental assistance. Right now, we're absolutely seeing high priced materials, a shortage of labor. We see inflation impacts. The infrastructure limitations I was talking about are those roads and sewer um, and water supplies. And so there's limits there. And then we have policies like this chart shows that we really like larger um, uh, lots for homes. I think it's, it's surprising to me to see this um, chart that I have on the slide here. To see Northeast, I mean, that's New England. I think of quaint little uh, villages. I'm in the village of Essex Junction right now, and I can tell you, I could throw a baseball to into my neighbor's house because I'm on a tiny, tiny little lot right at the five corners. Um, so I think of that kind of compact development in the Northeast. And I think of out West, I've been out to visit Utah, Montana, Colorado. I think of homes on these sprawling ranches with lots and lots of acreage. And I was shocked to see that the median lot size of newly constructed homes is bigger in the Northeast than we see out West. And there's local opposition. You can imagine when there's a new development going in, I don't know about your front porch forum, but I can tell you my local newspaper and my front porch forum gets filled when there's a new development happening saying, where are these people coming from? Why, you know, why do we need more one bedroom apartments? Where, what's all this development happening? I don't like the way our community has changing how it looks. I rarely see people writing letters to the editor saying, I welcome the new households that are moving into town. I welcome the fact that we're going to have more crossing guards because there'll be more kids walking to school. I welcome that there's gonna be more businesses as a result of all these new households, more restaurants, more shops, more things walk within walking distance. Um, you don't often see that kind of response. And so what happens is projects either don't get built or they cost more, which gets passed on to buyers. So there is a lot being done. I'm not all doom and gloom. I'm actually quite an optimist. Um, there have been, there are actively a lot of proposals being discussed in Montpelier. 
um, right now. They are looking, the legislature is looking again at updating Act 250, which is our statewide permitting process. And there's several proposals to um, incentivize communities, municipalities to update their local zoning, which is very important. There's a lot of communities out there that hasn't, haven't updated their planning documents or zoning documents in many, many years, despite the fact that our market has completely changed just in the last two years, much less the last five or 10 when some of these documents were last looked at. There also has been unprecedented investments of uh, federal stimulus money. Uh, shorthand, we call it ARPA because the most recent stimulus package was called the American Rescue Plan Act. So we call it ARPA funding. And so there's state money and federal stimulus money going into the creation of affordable rental housing. And then there's new programs being proposed that VHFA is a part of, that we're proud of, where we're proposing that some of the stimulus money go to affordable home ownership development. That's important because in our country, we have a long history, like back to the 1920s, of how we make housing affordable. And how we make housing affordable is on the rental side, we give tax credits and loans and have HUD programs that buy down, that make that building more affordable to build and operate. And then the people who live there get that below market rent because we've subsidized the actual building. If the building was gonna cost $5 million to build, maybe we can use government money to get it, it down to a million dollars. And then they only have to get a million dollar mortgage and so that is much more affordable because the other 4 million was paid for by federal um, and state sources, public sources. On the home ownership side, we don't do that. We don't have large scale programs that build affordable starter homes. Um, there is Habitat for Humanity. There are small self-help type programs and others that do build some homes but not to the same extent of what we're doing on the rental side. For example, in Vermont, we spend 60 to $65 million a year on creating affordable rental housing in a normal year, not with all this stimulus money that's happening now. This is a different scene altogether right now, but historically, we would spend about $60 million a year on creating affordable rental housing we spend about two to four million dollars a year on creating affordable home ownership. Instead, the US has chosen to make home ownership affordable through somewhat complicated financing mechanisms, like having Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac support a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. That makes housing more affordable if you have a fixed rate mortgage. If your income goes up each year for workers, then um, and your house price relatively stays the same, then that housing gets more affordable over time. A lot of people who itemize their taxes also have the benefit of writing off their mortgage interest or their property taxes. And so it lowers their tax liability. That makes housing more affordable, but it doesn't build the homes. It doesn't create the homes. It's not an incentive for developers. And so that's a program that we're talking about um, uh, creating now. I want to go, I'm going to um, uh, sample just a couple of the questions. I have some more slides, but um, I noticed that someone asked a question I'm looking for now about um, how is VHFA approaching the opportunity or the challenge of funds from ARPA to address the affordable housing challenge from a board member of a homeless and transitional housing nonprofit? Much of the money that is going directly, the stimulus money that's going to affordable housing is not uh, going through VHFA, but is going through our sister organization called the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. They've been around for 30 years and have a brilliant dual message of affordable housing and land conservation. And it's an award-winning model that Vermont pioneered that brought those two what I would say are unlikely bedfellows together. Because normally you have a plot of land and you have people say, develop it like crazy. We want all sorts of housing. 
And then you have other folks saying, conserve it. We have climate change concerns and we need to make sure there's green spaces and that these are livable communities. And there would be a tension and a fight between these um, ideas of what to do with this parcel of land. And by creating an organization, the Housing and Conservation Board, that by statute has to bring both those missions together and grapple with that in one conversation, we have really promoted smart growth where we decide, you know what, this is a village center. This is a downtown close to jobs, close to transit, um, has infrastructure and sewers and amenities. And so we're gonna put housing here so that we don't have to put it out in our conserved land that should be working lands and the like. Um, I also noticed that there was a question about, can I talk a little about affordable supported housing for those who need assistance due to a mental health condition? I would be happy to. In my intro, Kathy mentioned that I'm on the board of a statewide nonprofit. It's a mental health organization that specifically works with people without homes and have mental health challenges it's called Pathways Vermont. And the needs there are very great. I'm sure you've read the same media articles I have about how um, the, the mental health needs of our state and, and nationally are going up considerably. The stress, the anxiety, not just for our youth, but also for adults. We're all feeling the impact of the last two years of this pandemic. And so it is so much harder when I'm talking about housing wages and what people can earn, that's not assuming um, that they also need potentially additional supports to be successful in their apartment. And so there has long been priorities to make sure that the public money going to create affordable rental housing through VHFA has make sure that we um, build in supports for those units. And so VHFA for over a decade now has required that for our, um, we have a lot of programs and I don't wanna go into all the details cause we don't have enough time, but for our most competitive valuable uh, money that we hand out, we require that 25% of the apartments be set aside for people without homes. And then we require that the developer has a signed agreement with at least one, if not multiple service agencies so that the people living in those apartments get the supports that they need. And that has been wonderful. In addition, the stimulus money, the ARPA money that the state has, um, not just ARPA, but actually uh, there was other stimulus programs in 2000 that passed from the feds. And when that money came out, the legislature was very clear that that money had to go to prioritize homeless units. And so there was an expansion of shelter capacity as well as 800 new apartments for households that are homeless have been brought online just since the pandemic. And that has done wonders to address our homeless needs. Now, the problem is, is that the number of people experiencing homelessness is rising as fast as we're bringing units online, but that kind of prioritizing of people who are homeless and may have special service needs um, is continuing. I'm gonna go back to my slides, but I'm gonna answer one more question before I do, just to spice it up a little bit. I see a question about how is senior housing managed or made available in Vermont? It's a great question. A lot of just, let's see, we I have to start at the beginning. Sometimes I start multiple sentences and don't finish any of them. So I'm gonna have some discipline. Uh, there are 13,800 apartments that have received some kind of government assistance, the publicly supported apartments in our state. That doesn't count all the vouchers out there where an individual may have a Section 8 voucher and is renting a private apartment and their rent is being subsidized. I'm just talking about the ones where the building itself was subsidized with some kind of government funds and therefore the people living there are paying lower rent. Of those 13,800 apartments, just under half of them are age restricted. And so they have restrictions saying you have to be either 55 or more often it's 62 years old to live there. And a lot of those have great support systems in them as well. There's another award-winning model that Vermont 
um, has pioneered and now has brought to other states. It's been studied by the federal government and um, proven as an evidence-based best practice. And it's called the SASH model, the Support and Services at Home. It was created by previous leaders at the Cathedral Square Corporation, which is based in Chittenden County. But the SASH model is available at, I think it's hundreds, should I say hundreds of housing sites? I shouldn't say hundreds, I don't really know. Um, I don't know how many housing sites are covered by SASH right now, um, and I should look that up. Uh, but what it is, is that for every 100 residents, there is a full-time SASH coordinator providing services to those residents, as well as a quarter-time nurse who is available to those residents. And what we find is that providing services to seniors in their housing is very cost-effective and can lower their costs of healthcare overall. And so it's a great program. If you haven't heard of the SASH program, it's, um, like I said, available statewide through a lot of nonprofit housing providers. But senior housing is really, to go back to the question, senior housing is really managed differently at every building. Um, one developer, like Cathedral Square, is a well-known senior housing owner and developer of affordable housing. They will have uh, multiple buildings, and they're all managed separately. Cathedral Square has one. Uh, application, and you can check off what buildings you're interested in, but they're all managed a little separately. Some may allow for pets to be there, some will not. Some uh, will have on-site laundry and facilities, other senior housing may not. And so there's not really a way I can answer that question broadly about how senior housing is managed because frustrating for many who are trying to access housing, it's very individualized. And so there isn't so such a thing as one waiting list for all the senior housing in the state, for example. I'm gonna finish up my slides and then go back to questions because I see we have about 20 minutes left. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, also gonna take a drink of water. Thank you. So what can you do? I know that sometimes I give these talks and um, people get a little downhearted because I talk about the overwhelming need and the limited resources. It is a little different right now that there are more resources now than um, we have seen definitely in the 25 years I've been doing this, uh, many would say ever. Uh, and so that money is flowing through the proper channels to get out so we can build more housing, renovate more housing. But what average Vermonters can do is to support housing friendly policies, especially affordable housing. So for instance, when I made that comment before that not a lot of people write letters to the editor or send out front porch forum posts about how supportive they are about development happening in their community, I don't know why they couldn't. I will tell you that I wrote an op-ed and the headline was, I want more. And it talked about how I wanted more things in my community because I wanted my community to grow and be vibrant long-term into the future. Now, I think I wanna be very clear that any growth and any planning needs to be done thoughtfully and wisely, going back to that idea of conservation and development and how do we make sure that we're making smart decisions with both those features in mind. But, that largely happens when it comes to the kind of publicly supported affordable housing that we have in our state. I am just so confident that the housing we are creating is meeting multiple public policy goals. And so not only are we creating housing, but we also are um, preserving our historic buildings. And we're only building in designated areas like downtowns and village centers. We're not sprawling, you know, to pop individual homes on mountainsides that we want to protect. The housing we're creating with um, public subsidies is energy efficient. Some of it's net zero and it's going to be affordable long term. And it's really prioritizing those who need it most and have the lowest incomes. And we ensure that those affordability provisions are in place in perpetuity, meaning if we give money to a building now, then it will have to be affordable forever. 
And there's not going to be a time 30 years from now that the developer can cash out and walk away with public subsidy um, like was the fact that happens in many other states. VHFA has been pushing and encouraging more local housing committees to form. And so if you went to this housingdata.org website, you would find a housing ready toolbox and it would tell you about all the housing commissions or committees that we know about in the state. It would show you what their charter or charge looked like. How were they created? <clears throat> if they have a website, we point you to it. And then we give tools for um, how to, uh, to support these commissions. For instance, housingdata.org is a website where you can pull up um, every town in the state and get more housing information than you would ever want to um, read or digest, but it goes into what are the housing prices in my town? What are the rental prices? What's the housing wage? What's the vacancy rate? How many homes are heated with different fuel types so I can see what maybe the weatherization needs are in my community? Uh, is population and household size growing or shrinking? What's the age of the residents? Do we need more age-restricted housing or more non-age-restricted housing? All that information is on housingdata.org for every town. And um, it's information that gets updated every year. And so we try to give that information to these housing committees to look at what the local housing needs are and knowing that every town has very different needs. I've made some quick comments about that I live in Essex Junction and I want more. And that's because I do believe that Essex Junction, especially right in by the Five Corners, is the kind of community that the Regional Planning Commission and the local planning bodies have all designated as an area for growth. But that does not mean that 10 miles out when I get to certain parts of Essex Town or to Jericho or Underhill, that I think that the same housing solutions are appropriate. I think that housing is very location, 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 very location-based. And so, a housing commission can have those uh, conversations at the municipal level and really come to the right answers. We have VHFA has a new YouTube series um, where you get to frankly see me in this home office um, educating people on how the affordable housing system works in our state. There's videos on what the housing needs are of our state. Every five years we have to do a big study and I spent four and a half minutes um, telling you what the findings were so you don't have to read the 100 pages. Um, there's a video on why does it cost so much to build affordable rental housing because it's very expensive. Uh, what are the different housing agencies besides VHFA and the Housing Conservation Board? There's some others and how do we all work together? So you're welcome to see that as well as a recent survey that we um, posted or did that talks to builders about cost increases and the delays resulting from the pandemic. So I will have to ask my friend Kathy um, if my slide deck gets shared somewhere or posted. Those are links. If um, that's not shared with you all, I can um, somehow get those actual links to you. But you'd find them all through vhfa.org. Now, yeah. I'm done with my slideshow, so I don't know if we want to take down the slides, but I'm very eager to answer this question from my friend Helen Head, who I see um, has posed something to me. So do I stop sharing now, Kathy? Yeah, yep. go ahead and stop sharing, Mara. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, we can certainly get those links out to folks. We do a follow-up email, so we can send resource information out to our participants. So yeah, we can move into questions, and Krista has popped on as well. Um, so go for it. Great, I'll answer this one from Helen and then maybe we'll go back to the normal thing of Krista, you can let me know because I'm sure I've not gone in order and messed up the whole system here on you. But um, okay. Helen Head, the longtime, um, oh, there's my dog, uh, longtime chair of the housing um, uh, committee in the House of Representatives uh, is asking, it's not unusual for residents to oppose housing development, particularly in their own neighborhoods. As concern about the climate crisis grows, that may increasingly become a rallying point for those opposing housing growth at the local level. How do we address this? I think that that goes back to the questions around that balance of housing and conservation and that it's best discussed at a local level. 
Um, I think there are a lot of resources that I could share, but don't have handy right now that speak to um, the uh, uh, climate benefits of smart growth and that if we develop in our downtown areas, it actually is better for our um, the climate overall because people are driving less, they're working closer to where they live, um, and that there are just so many, um, there are so many benefits. I can appreciate that um, in South Burlington, this conversation has really come to a head recently, uh, but I think that we see this play out throughout Vermont in a lot of, um, in a lot of ways. So I think it just goes back to smart growth actually is more climate friendly than if we sprawl housing out and people have to drive farther and farther from jobs. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. Are Airbnbs killing affordable housing, especially rentals? Yeah, great question. So um, I know you want me to say yes, and I'm not going to, because I really do, um, you know, it's popular now to say follow the science. I follow the data. And um, as I said, about 19% of the state's housing stock, uh, it has always been vacation homes. And we know that short-term rentals are two and a half percent of our housing stock. And we don't know if that two and a half percent overlaps with the 19% of vacation homes, if that makes sense. Are the short-term rentals just vacation homes that are now have a new platform to be rented out through? Um, two and a half percent of our housing stock doesn't sound like a lot. But at VHFA, we really only look at the short-term rentals that are units that are available for a full month uh, and year-round. Because honestly, my next door neighbor snowbirds to Florida for a few months this time of year. And so they do short-term rental uh, of their home for the two and a half months that they're not here. Um, that home would never be available to renters of Vermont or home buyers because that household absolutely lives here all those other months. And so I just think it's important to really make sure that just because we see a growth in short-term rentals that we really dig in to be like, but would that be on the market but for um, this opportunity? The other thing I'll say is that uh, my comments a lot of times being from a statewide organization are statewide and gloss over local realities. We do see where our short-term rentals are, are in our ski communities. It's Burlington, but it's more so, it's Ludlow, Killington, Warren, Waitsfield. And in those towns, there probably is more of a um, relation because uh, we just know that there's so many short-term rentals in those towns specifically. Thank you. Out of the um, large amount of developments going on in our area, what is the percentage, in your opinion, of, uh, that are going into affordable housing? Yeah, uh, not big enough. Um, it's hard. There's a group called uh, Building Homes Together based in Chittenden County that has been studying this year after year. They set a five-year goal. This was five years ago. They set a goal of how much housing development um, needed to be built over the next five years and how much that should be affordable. And uh, at the end of the five years, we met the, barely met the housing development goal, but fell well short of the affordable housing um, goal. And so uh, it is a very small percentage of homes that are actually affordable. And um, so we need to be doing more in that regard. And another one with regards to affordable housing, is there any state requirement to, re, um, to require solar panels on affordable housing or any kind of renewable energy for that matter? There is not a blanket requirement for solar. Um, a lot of times developers have that in their budget and they plan to do that. Uh, and then because the cost of development is so high, they in the end can't do it. We do have green building and design standards that reward projects that do various uh, types of energy efficiency measures. And so uh, renewable energy would count towards that. And we really have, I think it's just over a thousand apartments in the state that um, have 
uh, advanced wood heat, for example, now, um, pellet boilers, uh, but there's not a requirement that that happens. And it's really this trade-off that we have that's very difficult between the cost of housing and these renewable goals. We know that the upfront cost is um, going to increase costs upfront, but then save money long-term, but it's hard to tack another thing onto the price of housing when housing's already so expensive to build. Uh, why are taxes so high here? Um, well, I see that the question is coming from uh, Brattleboro, and uh, there's probably many answers. One could say it costs, however much it costs, to run the town of Brattleboro. Now, you as a voter could have an opinion about if it should cost less to run the town of Brattleboro, but I'm just going to say it is what it is. And so I would argue that the more people we can divide that among and share that cost with, the less each of our bills goes down, which is one reason why I'm for growing in a thoughtful, smart way, many of our communities, because we are sharing that cost among more people. So my share goes down. Obviously, I'm not going to opine on to, you know, is Brattleboro paying the right amount for all of their municipal services and benefits and all that, because as I told you at the beginning, I only know housing. So I only know how housing solutions can address this, but it is um, helpful that our property taxes do have income sensitivity in Vermont. I understand that that doesn't mean, as I said, every individual income is unique and our expenses are unique. So I don't wanna say that, um, that we can all afford the same things, but income sensitivity is something that the state legislature has put in place to try to buffer that so that if your home price is high and so your property taxes are high, then it tries to buffer that for folks who are of modest means or on a steady income like seniors are. How are we helping refugees? Um, that's another good question. Uh, we have been helping refugees since the 80s when um, the refugee resettlement program began in our state. Now, obviously, we have a real influx. There um, are some proposals in the legislature to dedicate new services, new additional resources to refugees. Um, one thing that I think surprises a lot of people to hear is that new Americans do receive nine months of assistance when they first move to our country, move, uh, settle in Vermont. They get nine months of assistance. Much of that assistance all then has to be paid back. Um, and so a lot of people sometimes mistakenly think that this is free money that new Americans are getting that um, long-staying Vermonters don't have access to, but it really, in, in many regards, is just a loan. And so we are trying to uh, specifically work with the organizations, the public housing authorities that administer the rental assistance. They're trying to work with the refugee resettlement program to make sure that everyone has a rental housing voucher. But the housing stock doesn't accommodate a lot of the new Americans that we see. Many new Americans, and I frankly don't know if this is true for Afghanis like it has been for other um, nationalities that have come before, they have larger household sizes, and so they need bigger homes. And so they're often looking for three, four, maybe even five bedroom homes to live in. And not only are there not a lot of those still on the rental market, they've converted to home ownership, but we're not building a lot of those because as I said before, Vermonters have really smaller household sizes. So programs like VHFA is actually doing the opposite. We're encouraging more small, units to be built. And so we have a real way that we're missing serving new Americans as a result. Thank you. Um, this one question here, I've noticed a lot of new housing going up in Morris, Morrisville. Uh, what are the reasons for so much in one town as opposed to it being spread out within Lamoille County? Yeah, such a good question. Um, yeah, there are um, a couple, I'm thinking of two different developments. Uh, Village Center, and then a new one that actually is a split development between Morrisville and Stowe, which we haven't done new publicly subsidized affordable housing um, in Stowe in many years. Uh, Morrisville is a center of services, like I said, transportation, a lot of things. And so there is a factor of if you build it, they will come. 
and that the town of Morrisville has built up its municipal services so much that um, it, it is ideal for growth and it's been designated for growth. Uh, additionally, communities that have water and sewer and that kind of infrastructure are less expensive to build in than towns that don't have that kind of infrastructure and it has to be put in. And so there are many communities in Lamoille County that's all septic and they don't have um, that infrastructure that could support a 20 apartment building uh, like you can in Morrisville where there's sewer available. Thank you. Um, one for about South Burlington and another one about interest rates and that we'll be able to uh, close on those. Uh, why is there so much new building in South Burlington? Because South Burlington wanted it that way. Um, because South Burlington consciously knew that it was not only its own economic center of jobs, but also it is so adjacent to um, Winooski and Burlington area. I mean, that that's really our downtown core of um, development. And so uh, that is one of those areas designated for growth by the Regional Planning Commission and by the municipality itself supported by um, voters. And so there has been, again, really thoughtful process that has happened for many years um, through the planning, um, Commission Planning Committee, and it's late, I'm getting, losing my words now, uh, but South Burlington has really thoughtfully planned for growth and has ensured that affordable housing is a part of that growth. Uh, they get credit for, um, in their new town center, they have been the city downtown, uh, they have inclusionary zoning, which means that a proportion of all the new housing development happening there is required to be affordable housing. And that's something we only see in a handful of towns. And it's wonderful to make sure that if a town is gonna grow, that we know that some of it is protected for generations to come in affordability. Uh, but I, I encourage you all to get involved. There is South Burlington's example that they have an affordable housing committee. And so they've done extensive work for more than a decade, looking at the data, looking at the numbers and having these tough conversations locally. So um, if you're wondering about, is there really that much need for South Burlington? I encourage you to look on the municipal website to find the affordable housing committee and go to some of their meetings and hear some of their discussions and look at some of the data they've looked at because there's been specific housing needs assessments done for South Burlington that target why that kind of growth is called for. Thank you. Um, how, and we'll close with this question, how will rising interest rates and or inflation impact home prices and values in the future? Yeah. So there is a fantastic Washington Post article that um, came out. It was a commentary by Mark Zandi and another person, uh, which you can Google, uh, Washington Post, Z-A-N-D-I. Um, and it speaks to if we're going to tackle inflation, uh, we need to address building more homes. And his, his, Mark Zandi is the uh, chief economist for Moody's. And um, he's a very smart man who has data that shows that actually inflation, one third of our inflation calculator is set by home prices. Um, and so, because that's, like I said, 30% of what we spend our money on. And then another, I shouldn't quote the percentage, 10, 20% um, is actually like utilities and food and things like that. But that if we can make our housing as well as utilities more affordable, then uh, we actually can bring down inflation because we're bringing down what we pay for one third of, of the calculation that goes into inflation. And so I'm not saying that building more homes is gonna end our labor shortage, although I think it'll help because we'll have more workers who um, are uh, able to live here and get jobs. But material prices, you know, it is a reality that apparently they're shipping containers off the you know, shores of LA and the rest um, that are really impacting the uh, supply goods shortages that we have. But inflation overall is in part because we are 1.7, I think the article said, 1.7 million homes have not been built since the uh, last recession that should have been to keep up with demand of Americans nationwide. And that's like an entire year's worth of home building that we missed since the last recession. And that if we had built those homes, then that would help with inflation because 
the supply would be there to meet the demands. It's kind of a complicated topic to throw out at the last question. Um, and as I said before, are going to really probably lower that um, price appreciation that we'll see in the future. But I don't expect the interest rates, economists I'm listening to are not thinking that interest rates are going to pop a bubble and that we'll see price decline. So thank you for, for answering that um, a large question at the end here. <laughs> and uh, that's a wrap for our uh, Q&A. And uh, over to you, Kathy. Thank you, Maura. Yes, thank, thank you so much again, Maura, for, for presenting and sharing your insights and all of the knowledge that you have about our current housing situation here in, in Vermont. We really appreciate you coming today and speaking with our OLLI community. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, you will receive a link to our online evaluation form. We value your feedback, so please send that along. And we hope to see all of you next week for our fourth and final lecture in this series, Timeline. Elements with James Stewart. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.